You are listening to ReachMD, the channel for medical professionals. Hello, this is Dr. Penny Chris Etherton, president of the National Lipid Association. I'd like to welcome you to Lipid Luminations, hosted by Dr. Alan Brown and presented by the National Lipid Association. Our topic today on Lipid Luminations is prevention, lowering lipids, and related diet controversies. And our guest is Mary Philando, a registered dietitian and nutrition consultant and clinical lipid specialist in private practice in the Los Angeles and Orange County, as well as the Palm Spring areas. Mary, thank you very much for joining us. I'm looking forward to your thoughts. Thanks, Dr. Brown. So let's start off with some discussions about uh, the appropriate diet. The patients always get upset about the fact that the recommendations for what to eat and what not to eat seem to change as quickly as the wind direction. One thing that seems to be fairly well agreed upon and has not changed is the importance of saturated fat in the diet. So can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, I would say you are right about that. I mean, since the 70s, we've been saying that saturated fats are the cornerstone of the recommendation to decrease by 7 to 10%. For most people, that they don't even know what that means. So, you know, we help them understand and how to read labels when it comes to the high saturated fat foods, beef and high fat dairy, the tropical oils being one of the high saturated fat foods. Then I think the biggest question became, what should we replace these saturated fats with when, you know, we're looking to eat something else. So should we replace them with carbohydrates, which was the crux of, you know, the 1990s when everything became fat-free and people were eating tons of carbohydrate. And now we move to a period where, you know, we're looking at whether we should be replacing now with not the recommendation to eat low fat, but to eat healthy fats. So we look at a mix of monos and polys. Yeah, it's interesting because sometimes I wonder if we were part of the problem with the obesity epidemic by moving everybody to high sugar, high carb It items. probably was the response of the food manufacturers who took off on that. I mean, when Dean Ornish certainly started his studies in, you know, the mid-80s before it was actually published, there weren't so many fat-free products available. So his people that were eating non-fat were eating healthy carbohydrates rather than the kinds of carbohydrates people were eating in the 90s. The portions went out of control, so we can thank restaurants for that. It was tough for people. It really was tough. I know when I started in cardiac rehab at Cedars in 1988, the average BMI of our patients was somewhere around 24, 25. Now it's about 29 or 30. So we're looking at, you know, at least, what, one-third of Americans having metabolic syndrome. So we're looking at differences when you're looking at insulin resistance. That's when you really have to say, we really can't be using the lower-fat diets. We really have to push up the healthy fats and look more toward the healthier carbohydrates in there. Keeping in mind that we have a broad audience, not just lipid geeks like you and I, but a broad audience of doctors who listen to this show, if you were to give them advice in their office, you know, what exactly should we tell patients in simple words on what they should be eating? Tell us what you tell your patients. Yeah, that's a very good question. And I really look toward the OmniHeart study and the DASH studies and the Mediterranean eating style and look at whole food patterns rather than, you know, these individual 7% of this or 1,500 of that. It seems like it's easier to really focus on a whole food pattern. So the first thing we say is what to eat more of. So we're looking at those fiber-rich whole foods. We're looking, of course, at fruits and vegetables and whole grains. And when people are eating, I know the dietary guideline says make half your grains whole, but that's their kind of punchline. But when we look at the recommendations for fruits and vegetables and beans and, and all the other things, most people don't have room for any non-whole grain products. You know, even in a 2,000 calorie eating plan, you're only looking at three or four whole grains a day and three is the recommendation. So, eight to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables, at least, you know, three whole grains, oats, 
whole wheat bread, whole wheat pasta, quinoa, bulgur, barley, all these, you know, they're good and they taste good. Then you sprinkle in the healthy fats and we're looking at a balance. I mean, it's great to use olive oil when olive oil is called for, but it's also okay to use the polyunsaturated fats like soybean oil or corn oil or some of the other oils, as long as it's a liquid oil. And I always say, you know, All of those partially hydrogenated oils don't even bring a product home with those in there. Those, you know, then we'll get into, you know, staying away from or minimizing the trans and saturated fats. So the trans fats, there isn't a place for them. You know, they may sneak in here and there when we're out, but we really, when we can control things, we should not be buying any foods with partially hydrogenated oils. And when it comes to saturated fat, If patients are, or people are numbers people, sometimes they like to know, okay, my goal is 12 grams or my goal is 14 grams. And they can look at labels and decide, does this low fat cream cheese fit in or does this reduced fat something, you know, lifetime cheese or Jarlsberg light cheese, how do these things fit in? Because they're certainly right there on the label. So for other people, we would just say, you know, to minimize intake of the fatty meats, keep your portions to look like about the size of a deck of cards twice a day. So maybe a lot of times I tell my patients, do one vegetarian meal and then do another meal that maybe has your six or five ounces of salmon or chicken or something like that. That way you're going to be eating more vegetables. Maybe you're making a homemade vegetable soup and you're having it with a spinach salad with nuts and beans on it. That's a great meal. And then the last thing is it's just balance. Like you said, the calories. Balance those calories in and out and move more. Probably weight loss and exercise trumps everything. I mean, so if you can keep your weight at a desirable level or moving in that direction, that's really important. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to Lipid Illuminations on ReachMD, the channel for medical professionals. I'm your host, Dr. Alan Brown, and joining me to discuss lipid relationships and CBD prevention with regard to diet as well as diet controversies is our guest, Mary Philando. She's a registered dietitian, a nutrition consultant, and a clinical lipid specialist who's in private practice in the Los Angeles, Orange County, and Palm Spring areas. Mary, any changes on the thoughts about coconut oil? And, and I even I heard more recently that it's okay to have a fillet once in a while. So let's talk about those subjects. Okay, yeah, because it isn't all bad news. And even the Mediterranean, we'll do the fillet question first, but even the Mediterranean eating style, you know, in Mediterranean countries where they enjoy better rates of heart disease than we do, they eat about 12 to 16 ounces per month. So you're looking at three ounces or a small deck of cards every week or a six-ounce petite filet once every couple weeks. But if you're looking at how much saturated fats, and I mean, sometimes we just say that, but really and truly in a six-ounce filet, you're probably not going to get more than about six grams of saturated fat, and that can fit in. It just depends what else you eat that day. So if your clients are smart and they want to look things up on calorieking.com and they want to plan things out and they love meat, they can make meat work in. Some people would rather have feta cheese. They can make that work in. So if you know how to balance things, you can have some of your favorite foods. When it comes to saturated fats, not all saturated fats affect lipids the same way. So meat does contain stearic acid, which has more of a neutral effect on the LDL, but it isn't the only saturated fat in meat. So meats have palmitic acid and mystearic acid. Both of those are saturated fats that really do raise the LDL. So, you know, we don't have as carte blanche for the beef, let's say, as we do for the dark chocolate to fit in. Dark chocolate contains mostly stearic acid, which we don't think has much effect on your LDL. But you're looking at a heavy calorie load, you know, and if you look at manufacturers, they want you to eat a bar a day because that's when they make money. So it's really, you know, the amount that would be in about 60 calories of dark chocolate. Coconut oil, on the other hand, is very high in saturated fat, and it is the kind that increases the LDL, but it also increases the HDL. So this is where I think we get into 
now this whole saturated fat thing, you know, we're looking not just at LDL as the end, you know, the intermediate endpoint. We're kind of looking at lots of other lipids and not just, you know, effects on HDL. We're also looking at effects on endothelial function and, you know, food has effects and thrombic, you know, tendency and inflammation and insulin resistance. So it's hard to look at foods so individually and make a statement, is it good or bad? But if we were going to be asking that about coconut oil, we would still put it in the don't use it. It's very high in saturated fat. It may increase your HDL, but it could be better for you than replacing saturated fat with carbohydrates because those lower the HDL, but overall it's not a good choice right now. I'll never forget a very interesting study years ago where Dr. Vogel had given people egg McMuffin and a potato cake yeah. and then measured their endothelial function within a few hours after eating that, and they had pretty significant dysfunction of their endothelium. Yeah, kind of and shocking. you know, and really when you think about, let's say, Thanksgiving and people eating all that rich saturated fat and then, you know, how many heart attacks are happening on Thursday night and Friday morning? Yes. A lot. And just look at food also, not just from a lipid perspective, but a blood pressure management and weight management and so many other factors that come into play. We've had the fillet discussion, so that at least makes people happy they could have a fillet once or twice a month if right. they keep it to six ounces. And they don't cover it in butter and other things. Right. And I do think, I mean, if I was going to pick one thing that I don't like, it's butter. Okay. And I just think that, you know, when people are eating out, they may be thinking they're doing a good thing by choosing the salmon. And they don't know that in the back somebody's covering it in butter. Right. And then there's butter in the vegetables. And there's butter in the rice. And then on top of it, they go, I'm dining out, so I'll put a little butter on my bread. And by the time they're finished a restaurant meal, in a nice restaurant where they've had fish, they're probably getting about 30 grams of saturated fat for that meal, at least. So sauce on the side, and then you can make a decision, right? Right. And I ask my patients to say that they're allergic to butter. Could they please be sure that their meal is not prepared with butter? But it's fine to use oil. And if somebody, you know, has the extra calories and they want to put oil, you know, dip some bread in oil if they have whole wheat bread, then that's a good idea. Let's talk about the shellfish controversy. So particularly shrimp and lobster, things like this. Yeah, you know, I don't know why that, I mean, it's such good news that most of the shellfish is very low in cholesterol and cholesterol not being as important as saturated and trans fat. So we have to remember that too although the AHA still has a guideline of 300 milligrams a day for healthy people, and then the NCEP has a guideline for people that are trying to lower cholesterol of 200 milligrams per day, okay? So you agree that the amount of cholesterol in shellfish is relatively small. Oh, absolutely. And unless they're eating a bucket of fried shrimp, they can occasionally have shellfish, right? Sure. And like scallops only have 33 milligrams in three ounces, whereas a piece of chicken has 75. So scallops, mussels, oysters, clams, and crab are very low in cholesterol, much lower than chicken. And lobster has about the same as chicken. So if you can have it with a squeeze of lemon rather than butter, lobster is a great choice. And shrimp is a little bit higher at 152. So for shrimp, I say, you know, don't have more than the amount you can fit in your hand. Very low in total fat, good for calories, but a little bit higher in cholesterol. And then the only one that I say kind of is a little outreach is squid. And most people eat fried squid anyway, so they just shouldn't have calamari because that has 233. So that's up there with an egg yolk. But if you never eat an egg yolk and you want to have squid, go ahead. So this is why personalizing, you know, with like registered dietitian who can sort of figure out what you love so you can do what you love because life isn't worth living if you're not enjoying your food. But you can sort of make it work and figure out what's the best way for you to go personally. So I'd like to thank my guest, Mary Philando, registered dietitian and nutrition consultant as well as clinical lipid specialist who's now in private practice in the Los Angeles, Orange County, and Palm Springs areas. Mary, thank you very much for being our guest this week and for your excellent advice on Lipid Luminations. Thanks, Dr. Brown. Thank you for listening to Lipid Luminations, presented by the National Lipid Association. For more information, 
visit www.lipid.org.